morning and welcome. Uh, as in our book, uh, Ending Parkinson's Disease, we outline a pact to, uh, as a prescription for action to end Parkinson's disease. And the A of that pact is advocacy. To discuss advocacy, we're really fortunate to have one of the book's authors and the CEO of the Michael J. Fox Foundation, Todd Sherrod, join us. So before coming to the Michael J. Fox Foundation in 2003, Todd, you were a neuroscientist and you and your colleagues conduct, conducted some of the pioneering research that linked pesticides to Parkinson's disease in animal models. Can you tell us a little bit about that research? Sure, sure. Um, I was always very interested in the causes of Parkinson's. And as we have learned over the years, Parkinson's has multifaceted causes. There's certainly been a lot of evidence for the role of genetics and family history is increasing your risk factors for getting Parkinson's. But the role uh, genetics does not fully explain Parkinson's disease. It's a sporadic disease in the most part, which means that it's, you know, kind of pops up randomly in the population. And from my perspective, this really pointed to the potential role for environmental factors in the disease. And there had been some very exciting and important epidemiological evidence suggesting the role of pesticides increasing your risk of Parkinson's, other environmental toxins, um, things like rural living, people that used well water for their water source, all had increased risk of getting Parkinson's. So with this data from the human experience, the lab I worked in, which was led by uh, Tim Greenemeyer at the time at Emory University, tried to take some of those discoveries back to the laboratory to really understand could pesticides in fact lead to a lot of the neurochemical and neuropathological changes that we see in Parkinson's. And in the studies that we conducted, we focused on a pesticide called rotenone, which had been linked epidemiologically to Parkinson's. And also the way rotenone works, it, it targets the underlying, some of the same underlying science and biology that we think is involved in Parkinson's. In this case, um, oxidative damage and mitochondrial function. And what we may, the main finding we had in the lab is that if we exposed animals to rotenone, the animals would reproduce, the rotenone in the animals would reproduce many of the features of Parkinson's, motor dysfunction, neuronal loss in the brain, in the dopamine system that's impacted in Parkinson's. And it really provided some very direct causal uh, evidence that these pesticides can in fact cause Parkinson's-like symptoms. Um, in animals, and we believe, you know, is involved in the cause of the disease in the human population. In the book, we recount your story by saying Dr. Timothy Greenemeyer and two young neuroscientists, Dr. Ranjita Bertabet and Todd Scher, gave the chemical to rats. The animals then developed features of Parkinson's, including slow movements, an unsteady walk, a hunched posture, and, quote, the shaking of one or more paws that was reminiscent of a rest tremor. When they examined the rat's brains, they saw other signs of the disease, including loss of dopamine-producing nerve cells. They suspected that long-term exposure to low levels of certain noxious chemicals may eventually lead to Parkinson's. One of those chemicals is uh, Paraquat. Uh, the Michael J. Fox Foundation led an effort that included over 100,000 signatures to ban Paraquat, uh, a pesticide that's been strongly linked to Parkinson's disease. Can you tell us about the status of those efforts? Yeah, I think what we've highlighted in the book and what you've just uh, mentioned, I think is really important for people who are interested in this topic or impacted by this disease to focus on. Because there are things we can do to decrease the number of cases of Parkinson's disease, particularly given the evidence that these environmental toxins can increase the risk of getting Parkinson's. So we recounted the example in the laboratory of rotenone. There's similar data um, that came out of other laboratories that point to this other environmental, uh, environmentally used pesticide or herbicide or paraquat in, that can lead to Parkinson's-like syndromes in animals and has also been linked epidemiologically to the disease in people with Parkinson's. So one of the actions that we're trying to take and lead is to get these chemicals out of the environment and out of use in the human population because we believe that even if that resulted in one less case of Parkinson's disease, it would be well worthwhile. Um, so we've taken multiple efforts in um, to get Paraquat is still used in the United States to get this out of circulation and banned for use in the United States. 
I should point out that Paraquat is banned in use in 32 countries around the world, um, but still used in the United States. So two efforts that are, are ongoing. One is the petition, the, F, the EPA periodically does review the use of these chemicals. And Paraquat, excuse me, is currently under review. So we have an ongoing petition to try to get people to sign and put pressure on the EPA to reevaluate the use of, of Paraquat. There is also a bill that has been introduced by Congresswoman Velasquez from New York to try to get Paraquat banned in the United States. This is another action that we can take through our advocacy to try to uh, raise awareness of this bill or wherever you are, your local congressional representative, to get, try to get co-sponsors and more support for this bill. Um, and in total, the real goal here is to try to get these harmful chemicals out of circulation, out of the food supply, to reduce people's exposure to things that could be leading to neurodegenerative diseases. The current administration has proposed a rule that would limit the scientific evidence that could be used to formulate environmental policy. In November, you testified to Congress opposing that uh, action. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so there is a, a proposal that is being pushed that is uh, creatively titled Strengthen a Trans strengthening transparency and regulatory science. And the underlying goal of this is to uh, require that the EPA use data that is widely available um, in their evaluation of, of chemicals and, and what should be allowed to be used in the environment. Um, and at the highest level, I think we all agree that research data should be made widely, widely available so that the research community and others could evaluate that data and really look at the underlying raw data and basis for conclusions. I think what is concerning about the rule that the EPA has put forward is that sharing of clinical data, of human medical data, per personal data, has to be done in a responsible way, protecting the privacy of individuals. So the rule that the EPA has put forward is basically to say if the data, all the underlying raw data can't be made available, that science will not be used in the evaluation of a chemical. The concern I have and others is that in epidemiological studies, sometimes, and many times actually, the underlying data could disclose an individual's diagnosis, their address, um, their medical history. So we believe that there are ethical and appropriate ways to share the underlying raw data in a way that protects people's privacy, their medical uh, history, their family history, without um, and still provide that data to be used for the uh, evaluation of chemicals and other research. So we are strongly supportive of sharing of data, but in an ethical way, and that all the best available science should be used to evaluate these chemicals, and there should not be regulatory hurdles to limit the ability to use science to make these conclusions. This is something we feel pretty strongly about, and again, another area where advocacy can help. You know, these the government does work for the citizens, and we should speak up to make sure that the best available science is being used to evaluate the use of these chemicals, which impact our health and our, our um, trajectory of our lives. Some of our listeners may know Todd is on the understated side. Uh, understated side. Uh, boss and I tend to be a little bit louder. Uh, we do put in the book uh, uh, and our prescription for action, which are these black pages at the end of the book, uh, preventing Parkinson's, and we give you the, the, the the email address and phone number for the EPA administrator, Andrew Wheeler. So if you want to make your voices heard about banning parking, banning paraquat or uh, ensuring that science can be used to guide environmental policy, you can let him know. Given the role environmental factors and genetic factors play in uh, Parkinson's disease, what research efforts is Michael J. Fox Foundation leading on the environmental side? And there's been a lot of research in recent years on the focus on genetics and how genetic factors can lead to Parkinson's and, and really understanding the underlying science of the impact of genetic mutations. And I, I believe that while we're pushing on genetics, there's been an underinvestment in um, the impact of environmental factors in Parkinson's. I think there's really two goals of this research. Um, and I should point out the Fox Foundation for this reason has launched a funding program where we're currently soliciting applications from researchers around the world to advance increasing our understanding of environmental factors leading to Parkinson's. And there's really two main goals, in my opinion, of this research. One is to develop more data 
linking certain environmental factors to the cause of Parkinson's. And that data could then be used for our public policy efforts to support getting some of these chemicals out of use, out of circulation. Secondly, if we could understand what factors lead to the cause of Parkinson's, we could then go and understand and dissect more how the biology is impacted by those factors and lead that to develop new therapies with the goal of slowing or preventing Parkinson's. So I think this is a really important area of research. It's very hard research to be conducted. Epidemiological research is difficult. Um, for Parkinson's, it could be exposures that happen many, many years before the symptoms. So we need long-term studies. And I think it requires a, a very significant investment in this area and can have an immediate impact for people with the disease or people at risk for the disease. If we can get these factors out of the environment, that'll be key. And if we understand what causes Parkinson's, we can then develop these interventional therapies that we want. We're gonna take your questions from listeners. Uh, the last 10 minutes or so, we're gonna reserve for questions from you. So please uh, uh, get your questions ready. You have a good shot at getting your question asked to uh, Todd Scher uh, directly. Uh, Todd, the Michael J. Fox Foundation is the largest private funder of Parkinson's disease research in the world. Um, the NIH, uh, by contrast, is by far the largest uh, funder of biomedical research by any entity uh, in the world. Uh, yet its funding for Parkinson's disease is not keeping up with the rise of Parkinson's disease. Adjusted for inflation, uh, the funding for Parkinson's disease research has actually decreased over the last decade, while the number of Americans with the disease has increased 35%. So there's been a flat decrease adjusted for inflation, and the number of people with Parkinson's disease is rising. What needs to change? Well, I think this is another key area for our advocacy. The NIH needs to be funding more research in Parkinson's disease. And this is, again, we, we need to stand up for ourselves in this community and make it clear that we expect a greater investment in Parkinson's disease research. We conducted a study last year that determined that the economic burden of Parkinson's disease is over $50 billion a year. That includes medical, direct medical costs, as well as indirect costs, and that's in the United States alone. Indirect costs of uh, loss of wages, caregiver burden, um, secondary impacts of the disease. That is costing the American government an extremely amount of money to care for Parkinson's. The only way we really can reduce that burden is with new and improved treatments that come directly out of investments in research. So we have the data to support why this should happen. There's a moral reason why this should happen. And it's no one will fight for this cause except us. So this is another area for us to stand up on our advocacy and demand that the federal government put more research funding into Parkinson's disease. The ideas are out there. The talented scientists are out there. And we need to engage them and give them the resources they need to advance our understanding of the disease and convert that into treatments. Can you tell the uh, listeners a little bit about the Parkinson's Congressional Caucus and how they can get involved? So there, there is interest from, from a lot of congressmen and senators about uh, Parkinson's and neuroscience. Um, and I think there's, uh, if you go to our advocacy website, you could see some of the congressmen and women that have stand, stood up to support this area. Um, but we, but you know, there's a lot of different topics that Congress, Congress is focused on. So I think if you, again, take your uh, citizen hat on and speak, get your word out there and, and let the Congress know that this is important to us, um, it will carry a lot of weight. So, so uh, listeners can go to the parkinsonscaucus.org and see if your uh, representative has signed up to be part of the Parkinson's Caucus, and you can encourage them to increase funding for NIH. And, and if they're not a member of the caucus, ask them to be one. <laughs> we should all be members. Um, Michael J. Fox Foundation, in addition to working with public funders, has worked a lot with private funders, chiefly pharmaceutical companies. I think last year you uh, helped uh, fund the development of the new formulation of levodopa, uh, an inhaled formulation that was approved by the FDA. Uh, you continue to work with uh, pharmaceutical companies to develop new treatments for uh, Parkinson's disease. Which of these is most exciting to you? 
Yeah, so I think just uh, the most important point you made, Ray, is that we need all this community to be working together. It's an important role the foundation plays to try to bring government, academic researchers, and the pharmaceutical industry together. It's going to take all of us, a collaborative effort, and also people with the disease participating as in the research, telling us what needs to be focused on, and participating as research participants. That's how we'll make the progress. Um, from my perspective, in uh, what's very exciting about the drug development pipeline in Parkinson's now is how robust it is, how many new drugs are in clinical testing, and most excitingly is that there is a more than a dozen therapies being tested now that are targeting the underlying disease process, not just trying to manage the symptoms. And that I find to be the most exciting. Some of this has come out of the genetics that we've discovered, really trying to target the underlying cause, the underlying biological mechanisms of the disease. And what's exciting is those therapies have the potential to change the trajectory of the disease, slow the progression, prevent some of the negative outcomes that happen long-term. So that's what I'm most excited about. It's a quite robust pipeline, a um, lot of activity, um, and we need just some of these to keep moving forward and, and get some successes. Can I push you to pick one that's got you most excited? Um, I think I would pick it by the targets, like the science. So I'm most excited. We have a number that are targeting the alpha-synuclein pathology in the brain. What's exciting is that there's a portfolio of therapies going after that, but we know a lot about the, the role that that pathology plays, and we believe it's involved in the progression of the disease, the aggregation of this alpha-synuclein protein. So I'm very excited to have therapy that could get rid of that, that pathology, and we have at least 10 that are currently in, in trials targeting that process. So we have some questions from the listeners. Eve Hyatt, hopefully I pronounced her name correctly, says, do you have any studies going on about mold exposure in Parkinson's disease? She's been exposed to mold and has Parkinson's disease. Is there a link and are there any studies ongoing? Yeah, I ha I'm not aware of any studies focusing specifically on, on mold exposure. An area of research um, that is probably related, could be related to this, that has really picked up re in recent years is focused on uh, neuroimmune responses and uh, how the immune system, uh, activation of the immune system could impact the neuro neurological systems and lead to neurodegeneration under certain circumstances. So I think there's another area of um, environment, which is how your body reacts to these environmental exposures. And that could be sort of the interplay of environment and genetics. So there's a lot of research in that area. Um, I'll have to go and dig a little bit more to see if there's anything more specific on mold. Uh, another thing is indoor air pollution from this chemical called trichloroethylene. Common contaminant of groundwater can evaporate from groundwater and soil and enter people's homes and workplaces undetected. It may be a major factor. Yeah, one of the things that I think is very interesting, which I had meant to mention is Two of the earliest symptoms of Parkinson's disease are loss of sense of smell and digestive problems. Those are the two areas of your body that are the direct interface of your body with the environment. So I think it really does point to perhaps something from the environment and how your body is interacting with that, with those exposures leading to some of the early symptoms of Parkinson's. We see that with the coronavirus uh, itself in terms of loss of smell, for example. Um, Kate Quinlan asks, uh, how do we sign the petition to end the use of pesticides? Is the Paraquat petition still active and are there others out there? Yes, the pesticide petition is still active and this is where it's probably in the book as well. If you visit advocate.michaeljfox.org, that will have not only the pesticide petition, how you could send your support for the bill to ban Paraquat, and a lot of other information about how you could contact your congressional uh, representatives. Um, and this, it's also in the um, action network, uh, action section of the book on how you can uh, get involved in these areas. Uh, an anonymous question is, if indirect costs of Parkinson's are so high, $25,000 per person with the disease, so in terms of caregiver burden and lost wages per year, 25,000, why is society not paying more attention to Parkinson's? Yeah, I think this is partly the goal of our book. We need to draw the attention 
to Parkinson's. Society doesn't naturally pay attention to things until they are affected and individuals affected themselves. And I think it becomes a, a burden and an opportunity for us to raise the aware, awareness of the challenge of this disease and that there are tangible things that we could be doing on the research side and the advocacy side and the healthcare side to improve the situation. Uh, Monique Bozeman uh, asks, could research on the understanding of the difference in Parkinson's and men and women disclose the mechanism of how it originates in the body and brain and how the body and brain responds? Is this a topic of research at the moment? Yeah, this is so, just the background on this, Parkinson's is about two thirds men and one third women in, in the general population of Park, Parkinson's patients. So um, there is a, num a lot of research to try to understand why that's the case. Um, one of the hypotheses actually does pull us back to some of the environmental exposures in that many of the exposures that have been linked to Parkinson's, at least historically, were things that men would be exposed to more than women. Industrial chemicals, environmental toxins out on the farms. Um, I don't think that explains all of it. So there is uh, research looking at the underlying biology and what could be explaining you know, these differences. But I think in, in, re, in at the high level, the question is completely on, on point, which is if we could understand what causes the disease, we then have a much better chance of developing the cure for the disease. Hi, Ian Kramer, who shares his story in Ending Parkinson's Disease and is actually part of the book, has a question. Uh, good morning, hi, Ian. Todd, I've been participating in the Michael J. Fox PPMI study for close to four years as someone diagnosed with a GBA mutation. I've been participating through IND in New Haven at one of the research sites, and I'm impressed with the an ambitious work underway. What do you hope PPMI achieves within the next five to 10 years? So just as a, a step back, one of the main challenges we have in Parkinson's is the variability of the disease. Um, people progress at different rates. There are people who get Parkinson's earlier in disease versus earlier in life, later in life. Some people, as the question mentioned, have a genetic mutation that may be responsible for their Parkinson's. So the goal of the Parkinson's Progression Market Initiative, which Ray is actually part of as well, is to try to get a better handle on the natural progression of Parkinson's disease, understand the variability of the clinical progression, have extensive brain imaging to understand what's happening in the brain, and have extensive biological uh, understanding by collecting blood samples, spinal fluid samples, to really try to segment the disease and understand can we predict who's going to have a better course of the disease, a more rapid progression, and ultimately then to be able to develop better clinical trials because we could be much smarter about what we're developing the drugs against and how we're testing and measuring the effectiveness of those drugs. One of the main goals we have for, so another great aspect of PPMI, which we talked about earlier in this session, was all the data is made available to the entire research community to, to really make the most out of this data, increase our understanding of the disease. So our goals are to continue to follow the individuals with the disease now that are part of the study. People have been in the, in the study now five up to eight years, so really getting a great understanding of the trajectory of that disease from the day of diagnosis out five, 10 years. And we're in the process now of expanding the study to increase the number of participants and particularly to expand the study at people who are at risk of developing the disease. So prior to the diagnosis of Parkinson's to try to get a greater understanding of what's happening before the symptoms become uh, pre pre present so we can really understand the earliest and earliest features of the disease. A little bit related to that, Renee McNiff asked, if a parent has Lewy bodies, could they be part of a study that is currently ongoing for Parkinson's disease? So I think one of the important things we talked about is that we need all of us to participate. We need to get more researchers into this field, but people with the disease and their, and their families can participate also and give us information, provide samples, and help solve the problems, um, the solutions we want. Um, there are, uh, on the Michael J. Fox Foundation website, as well as another website, clinicaltrials.org, there's a listing of all the clinical trials that are ongoing in the United States for Parkinson's disease. 
for Lewy body disease. Um, and I would suggest that that would be a great area, uh, a uh, resource to look into. This is another action area of the pact in the book, to participate in research, become informed, and there are resources like the ones I mentioned to understand where these studies are happening and what types of people they're looking to participate in those studies. We have a couple more minutes, hopefully get a couple more questions in. Uh, Sarah Pisani is a research assistant at University College London and inter interested in the interaction between biological and environmental factors. She asked, has there been a study comparing the level of pollution uh, and the use of pesticides across countries and their contribution to Parkinson's? Yeah, I mean, this is something that we've looked at in some of the, the studies that we reference in the book. Um, Excuse me, there is not a great variability of Parkinson's disease across, I mean, across different countries. It affects everybody everywhere. Um, business, biggest risk factor for Parkinson's is age. So the, lo the lo more people we have in the world that are over a certain age, the more people that have Parkinson's. Um, there have, one of the most interesting studies that I have seen that's looked at things like this is in the, the state of California where they have overlaid um, the pesticide and environmental toxin maps with prevalence of Parkinson's. So in California, they have and different um, crops that are used. So there's different chemicals that are used. There also are industrial sites. So there are different um, industrial chemicals that have been used in different regions of the, of the state. And they've been overlaying that um, with the where Parkinson's is found. And that's where some of the things are, have been found, like with rural living, increasing your risk. We are also advocating now to try to establish a California patient registry for Parkinson's that would also identify all patients in California with Parkinson's. So it could be combined with some of these as well. But I think this is a good question. It's a, a great area of research. Um, and I think the, the main thesis of the book is that a lot of these more modern pollution and environmental chemicals are leading to an increase of Parkinson's, and we need to understand why and how to stop them. Uh, I'm going to ask you maybe two more questions. Uh, Sue Vandal uh, sends her greetings from Canada. She says she lives in a small town in northern Ontario and has next to no options for movement disorder specialists or exercise programs specific to PD. How do you suggest we advocate for more recognition for those of us with Parkinson's disease in small towns? Yeah, I think this is a real challenge. There's a shortage of movement disorder specialists with that expertise in general. So this is a neurologist like Ray that has extra training to be particularly focused in movement disorders like Parkinson's. So for long range plans, the Fox Foundation has been supporting additional fellowships in this area to train more researchers um, and clinicians in movement disorders. I think the other area that we've been working on a lot, and, and Ray actually has been a leader in this, is to try to bring the doctor to the patient. So one of the things that's happening a lot now in the United States and in the world is uh, more telemedicine, using technology to help people that are more you know, um, geographically limited in access to care. Can we bring the care to them? And right now in the United States, for reasons that were forced on us, this is really taking off in Parkinson's disease. Um, and we are advocating at the, at least in the US government, to make this more permanent uh, so that people can have access to the expert care they need no matter where they are. Uh, last set of questions, but there were some that are unanswered. We'll maybe send those to you if you can reply to them later. Sure. Answers. Yeah. But the last set of questions are around coronavirus. Uh, Dave Orlo Orlovsky asked, do you think the coronavirus saga has taken funds and attention away from the PD pandemic, or will it help learn a lesson in the long run by finally recognizing Parkinson's disease as a pandemic that needs to be dealt with now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to know what the, uh, what the impact will be of this, both short-term and long-term. I mean, right now, unfortunately, a lot of research is getting um, negatively impacted by the situation. You know, if uh, universities are closed, labs are closed, so, um, you know, that's going to be a, hopefully a temporary delay in getting things restarted on, on research. I'm hopeful, actually, as well, that what this situation is bringing attention to is the importance of research and proactive research and, and science driving solutions. 
So while I, I think in the short term, you know, not only is Parkinson's research being impacted, the whole world's being impacted. I'm homeschooling my kindergartner right now. Um, but my hope is that this is going to, and I think this is part of our goal, and it's on us to push this message out, that this shows how important investing in research around health is and how doing that proactively and making that a top agenda item for the country and not secondary. Because when our health is not where it needs to be, nothing else can happen. And that's what we're seeing right now. So um, yes, I agree with the, the kind of thesis of the question that right now the world needs to be focused on this virus because it is stopping all other progress from happening. But I think the opportunity we should take going forward is really that that means we need this momentum in other areas. We need to relook at regulations that may be slowing down research. Um, and how do we keep the support for our researchers going so that we could get these solutions? Because science will lead to the solutions that we want, and we need to invest in that science. That's a great way to end it. Uh, Todd, thank you very much for making time. I know you're really busy in New York uh, with the pandemic and with running the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Thanks for all your efforts on behalf of the Parkinson's community. Thanks, Ray, and, and read this book. <laughs> Thanks very much.